Hello, everyone, and welcome to World's Cool Down, presented by State Farm, your one-stop wrap-up for all things Worlds. I'm Dash, joined by Crumbs, DeMonte, and Kobe. Gents, North America, we got our first win tonight. Let's Woo! take a moment to celebrate, shall we? Oh, yeah. All right, cool. Moment's over. Uh, <laughs> DeMonte, thank you so much for lending us uh, your time here. I want to come to you as we pull up the standings of all four of our groups uh, so far. What's been your take three days into the group stage here of Worlds 2020? Uh, FlyQuest is gonna win worlds. We got we're on the board, baby. That's what I'm. T that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> there it is. There it but, is. But real talk though, I think we're seeing some amazing games out of the Chinese teams, and it's something that is just so exciting to watch, and it's so much fun to watch too. Yeah. Um, another takeaway for me though is that Korea is freaking back. <laughs> These <laughs> teams are really not messing around. Damn one and Gen G have been crushing it, and yet yeah, DRX has dropped some games, but. They're competing with what we thought was the tournament favorite. Yeah, they dropped a game, as we just saw, two DR, uh, two uh, top esports, another contender to win the entire tournament, and it was a banger of a game as well. Yeah, uh, to, to say the least, uh, I love you calling out the LCK teams there, Crumbs. It is kind of feeling like a two-horse race right now at the World Championship when it comes to the regions competing at the top of the table, the LPL and the old kings in the LCK. Let's start, though, with one of the most anticipated matchups of these group stages, and it's that one you just mentioned, Top Esports versus DRX, and we just saw it conclude. Yeah, I mean, th this is an awesome uh, little bit of a replay here from the uh, DRX one, uh, where we do have top esports diving on bottom side. Deft goes down four people. This was the moment, though, where they overdive. Up until this point, DRX had a lead, and they try and get the extra kill here on the Nocturne. He's so close to going down, but they can't finish the kill. Then Lee Sin goes down. That's a big shutdown for Nocturne. They also were able to get a Chovy after that. Uh, and from there, it was a big backswing in the gold, and they were able to fight it right back. I think something. I, uh, oh, go ahead. I just, I just want to say how cool is it that we get to see a nocturne in the game, and then it goes in the mid lane, and then it's also played by night. Like that is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah that's the draft, right? the happiest man in the world. You got Quinn as well. Quinn versus the Renekton. You've got Draven in the bot lane. It seems like it's a janky draft, but when you look at who the players are behind these champions and how they can actually coordinate around making the most of what the champions provide, you can start to see why they are allowed to draft this way and still win. What do you mean, janky? That that was full of counter picks. This is full of high explosive champions. This is this is what I want to see, right? Because if you go down, if you go down the list, you're like, okay, you open up with Twisted Fate, super highly prized in the meta right now. You know, for roaming across the rest of the map, they counter it with the Nocturne, who can follow plus W shield the uh, point and click stuns, and a Tom Kench, who can also uh, travel long distances, bring players to the one three one game when you have this split pushing Quinn that you're gonna have to deal with. And can devour people also out of the point and click stuns. It just these are rarely right. seen because so so few players have the confidence to play skill matchups. And all these champions are are highly variable because they're low health, high damage, and high skill cap. If you had to pinpoint where the jank is though, the mid two v two Quinn Lee Sin, not ideal. Yeah, crumbs. Point me in the direction of the jank. No, but what I love about this, what what I love about this is that it is our it is our best teams or our perceived best teams at the World Championship that are kind of breaking some of those meta molds. I think so often when we're at international tournaments, we look towards the teams at the bottom of the table to say they're the ones who are going to have to find that unique pocket pick or a way to kind of mess things up when it comes to the draft. But when you see some of these players who are you know number one, number two, number three in their role in the world, and they're bringing out things that no one yet has looked at or approached here at the World Championship. It just makes it all that much more interesting, especially when you consider how things evolve, typically second week of groups and then into the knockouts, Kobe. Yeah, this is why I'm so happy, James, because when I see the highest level of play, when I see the best players in the game, Knight, Chovy, top two mid laners, I want to see them pushing the limits, taking chances, playing risky comps, playing risky combinations. I don't want to see boring sit back, you know, quote unquote, perfect League of Legends with no kills where you're only objective focus. I want them to get in there. I want them to try and create leads. And they did just that. Okay, let's be real though, DeMonte, those stats on the left side of the graphic there, those aren't the prettiest looking stats for a mid laner in a game. Yeah, this definitely does not 
paint the picture all that well. I think Nocturne is definitely a champion that is not going to sit here and pump out stats in the same way that a uh, range champion would. But definitely Knight did not play too well in that game early. And even in the mid game, he was getting caught a little bit. But I don't think it's anything that Top Esports should be scared of or worried about. Yeah, to say the least. I mean, they now sit at 2-0, and so able to scrape through on that victory. Crumbs just coming back to you as a final point on this matchup. Again, a lot of people looking at top esports as a tournament favorite. But DRX, in your case for the LCK teams, I mean, how, how is it all shaping up now three days in with some of the, now seeing some of these, you know, more high-profile matchups and, and your, your kind of uh, pinpointing of regional strength? I think DRX in particular just has a really high chance of making it out of the group. And if you see just the groups in general, it seems like LCK is just going to make it out. They're just better than the teams that are in third and fourth in their respective groups. And they improve in the best of series, right? So I think that the fact that LCK is back in group stage should be a really scary thing coming into a best of because preparation has always been one of the LCK's biggest strengths. Yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. I do want to hear from the man himself who piloted the Nocturne in the mid lane there. So we're going to head, head, head on over, rather, to Lore, who caught up with Top Esports Night. Thank you very much, Dash. Lore here for the last interview of the day with Knight. TS is on 2-0 here in the World Championship, but I want to ask about the pick you chose here, because I don't know if you know that, but we have a caster. He's a very huge fanboy of Nocturne, especially in the mid lane. So talk me through this pick and why you thought it was a good decision to pick the champion here. <laughs> So actually in the Bampik phase, the opponent's team have banned out four mid champions, but the Actually, I have a very deep champion pool, so that's why I've just picked up, pick up my secret, secret weapon. Wow, and it was a very good secret weapon here. But tell me more about the meta mid lane, because we've been used to seeing kind of the same champions every time. So how, what do you think about the meta mid lane right now, and how deep can it get? 那我们说一下就这个版本的一个中单的英雄选择，因为其实好像大家感觉现在世界赛版本就那么几个中单英雄出场，那你会怎么样去看待现在的一个中单呢？这版本前置中单是比较固定的，但是前置中单被搬的话
Thank you very much, Laura. Great to hear from Knight after that victory out of top esports over DRX. Again, uh, two tournament favorites, a lot of people citing as uh, two of the teams that could go quite deep into the tournament. And so great to hear from him on his thoughts around mid lane meta, the team and their synergy and ability to bounce back from even some of those losing team fights that we saw within that game. I do want to rewind, though, all the way back to the first game of the evening as we roll through a couple more of our recaps. G2 versus Machi, the European squad taking the victory in this one to move to 2-0. and Crumbs, your thoughts here? That I don't think G2 should be slept on. You had DRX and that one, <laughs> or sorry, Top Esport and that one looked great, but I thought G2 had a really solid game plan, and a lot of it was wonder. They set up a really level, good level one for him to get some kills, and then he ends up collapsing here to kill the Gray, so now you already have two kills. But at this point, his kill participation is really high, and they just, can, just continue to play around wonder, who is probably or maybe definitively Europe's best top laner right now, which shows that at the very least, G2 is competing with what these other two teams are bringing to the table, which is really capable top laners. Yeah, OB top is lane is definitely going to be a big topic uh, you know, for the world's meta, as everyone was expecting coming into it. Um, and with the Camille pick, plus the early uh, kills that he was able to, to acquire, them combining that with a Galio. Camille Galio, one of the best easiest to execute combinations for pushing a lead ahead really set them up for success. We saw here earlier in the highlight reel how Yankos got chased down and, and he got killed early. After that though, they were able to aggressively help him with a lot of these invades. He started to step it up a lot. I was a huge fan of Mickey's Hail of Blades, Tom Kench. Oh my goodness. On them, getting solo kills even for the team. Uh, and as well as being able to save people later on. G2 are a team that have a lot of style in addition to some very strong players. They have had to you know, take a little bit more time to ramp up through summer, but that, that does make the story super exciting. Yeah, uh, think, oh, go ahead, just jump yeah. in. One, one thing I want to mention is this mid-jungle combo that we're seeing from G2 this game. It's not the first time we've seen it, and it's definitely not going to be the last time we've, we're seeing it. And it's the Nidalee and the Galio combined. And a big reason that the teams are opting into this is Galio is a very selfless champion. It's a champion that doesn't really require help from his jungler. But where like you, You'll see a champion like Syndra or Orianna where it requires a lot of assistance to make it strong. Galio doesn't need any of that. And I think that combo together fits really, really well. So I think My kind of mid laner. <laughs> I think you've played that with closer. Like when you have that combination, is the Galio looking to be the shot caller, or is it just like you just following Nidalee no matter what she wants to do? Um, I would I would think about it in a different way, where actually the Nidalee would be following the Galio, and a big strength of the Galio is that it's able to go first a lot of the time, and. When the, when the mid laner is suddenly going first and not the jungler going first, it makes it a lot easier for the jungler to play. Uh, Tanner, I also want to get your opinion on uh, Wonder as an individual because we talk uh, all, all throughout this tournament about the importance of the top side of the map. Uh, G2 Wonder pulling out the Camille in this one. And when we look at a lot of those uh, top LPL teams and what makes them so great or top LCA, you know, LCK teams, we're looking at players like Nuggery. Can Wonder, can he hold a candle to these other top laners? I think so. I think he can. I think I think Wonder, he's already showing it in this tournament that he's definitely a force to be reckoned with. And the fact that he's able to play Camille at a high level and just pick it into any matchup, I think is a great sign for G2. And I think it's something to look out for as the tournament progresses. Can I direct your attention to the bottom stat there? Gold difference at 15 was almost 2,000. We see so many teams not able to get a 2,000 gold lead. That's one player, one matchup with a 2,000 gold lead and a champion that scales incredibly well too. Obviously, Camille scales really well with items. Yeah, yeah, you love to see it. I think for me, uh, especially as a Western fan, uh, I, I like to see G2 putting up numbers like that, especially off the back end of the performance that we saw just yesterday from G2. You heard shocks at the top of the day, citing those statistics around Caps' uh, TF performance and the damage that he was able to output in that setting one records. alongside Perks as well. Setting records, exactly right. But then, you know, in just a day's time for kind of the, the script to flip and the carry comes out of the top laner uh, for this squad, I think that instills a lot of confidence in me that the, this is one of the Western teams that might really be able to stack up here at the, you know, throughout the remainder of the group stages and into the knockouts. And the I returning think finalists. 
Finalists? You say, are they going to run it back, Crumbs? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I, I said returning finalists. Oh, I said they're okay. returning finalists. They have the same roster. I think they're really, really good. I, I think okay. T2 actually has a pretty good chance of making it. I think, I, think like, I didn't I hear think the returning, so I just heard finalists. <laughs> like, you were calling it like they were going again. And I was like, I like that call, but it's a bold one, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 that one win's got into my head, Dash. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Uh, we should also call, uh, call out Yankos. While we're talking about top performers, it wasn't just Wonder in this one. I think Yankos, uh, uh, similar to some of his previous games, didn't have the hottest start, uh, but had a significant recovery within this game. And yeah, definitely high highlighting like how he bounced back in this game was really, really good. He, he died on a silly invade, and then after that, he didn't die for 30 minutes straight. There was even a time in the game where he was up there trying to help Wonder, and Wonder just ran it down, and he just watched him and was like, well, I'm not going to die with you, bro. <laughs> you, love, you love to see that. You love to see that. Uh, all righty. Well, from there, we do need to step away for just a quick commercial break. On the other side, though, we've got Lyric, who will be joining us to break down the LPL matchups of the evening. Don't you worry. More, cool More World's Cooldown is coming at you after this. Welcome back to World's Cooldown, where Crumbs is out, Lyric is in to help us break down the LPL matchups from this evening. And it's going well for the LPL, my friend. We are going to kick things off with TL versus Su Ning, where Su Ning made every second count, putting immense pressure on the TL bot lane. Made possible, of course, by the Cisco Network. Uh, how'd you feel about this play down here in the bot lane, Lyric? This play was absolutely amazing. I love that we finally saw the Twitch Rakan bot lane uh, get punished. Huan Fong is a famous uh, Draven player. He actually used to be the understudy of Jackie Love, so it makes a lot of sense. And uh, in this play, it was just really hard for TL to even punish on the opposite side of the map. And from here, it was really just Sooning's game to snowball and close out. Yeah, I was just in love with this because it was so powerful. They did this with the Nidalee already in their control too. So huge winning bottom lane and they use this for constant invades. Yes, the bottom lane is a tragedy uh, for Team Liquid. You know, Twitch gets super far behind, getting zoned from experience and stuff. But this is at the same time, Nidalee has Flame Horizon, Broxas Lee Sin. Uh, so it's it translates into complete map control, not just you know one little area here. And and that was one of the biggest parts. Like Sunni just completely dominated from the get go for T TL side. I know I saw you know tweets coming out from the players. They felt like they had no tools to work with right from the preparation and the planning from Sunni, and they just executed on it just as well. I mean, Demonte, Kobe was making a big deal about the individual gold lead that Wonder had built in his lane. Take a look at that graphic there on the bottom Ooh. of our screen. It's not a 1900, it's a 2600 for a Draven at 15 minutes. Absolutely insane. I would love to have this guy on my solo queue team any day <laughs> of the week. Yeah. I, I, another thing I do want to highlight this game is another game where we see Nidalee Gallio, and I think this is almost an even better scenario than before where G2 had it. This time they have a full counter pick on bot side and on top side it's like a pure 50-50 matchup and you, you saw Galio was able to maintain priority and he was able to run down to the bot lane anytime he wanted. Don't, this is not saying that Jensen had a bad game by any means, but I just want to highlight the fact that Nidalee Galio was played again and I think it's just going to keep coming. Yeah, in fact, this game, it did feel like Jensen recovered a bit from the poor performance that he had in yesterday's game, whereas the rest of Team Liquid, it did seem, uh, fell down just, just a little bit in this series here. But, but Lyric, I want to come back to you uh, specifically, uh, you know, not only on this game, but kind of the way that Group A is shaking out, because this one still feels to me like one of the most undecided of the groups. Yeah, it's a bit weird because, I mean, even when we look back to Suning's match against G2, it felt like it was in Suning's favor for a lot of that game. Exactly. It does look like like a bit of a, a two-horse race, um, unless Liquid can start getting it together, but Machi's been a decent surprise. And I think this group has been defined by a lot of, let's say, like like cheeky plays in the mid game, being able to surprise and outmaneuver your opponents through side lanes. I think G2's been doing that a lot. And I still feel like it's a bit up in the air if Machi can kind of like throw their hat in and shake things up a bit between G2 and Suni. Yeah, with that too, Kobe, I think though does some does come rather some continued questions around uh, the drafting for Team Liquid. It just feels as though they're left without a couple tools that they need in their toolbox right now at Worlds 2020.
Yeah, I mean, people have really been highlighting the preparation, uh, and we just talked about for Sooning how how good their game plan was. Uh, felt like they had the plan from Champ Select and executing all the way through their level one, uh, through the focus throughout the game. Those are the types of things that that are going to be a big difference, and those are the things that you know TL or Machi, if they're going to get wins versus you know G two or Sooning, who are heavily favored in this group, it has to come from a ton of preparation, a really well laid out game plan. Uh, uh, you know, to get one of those best of one wins. Yeah, now Lear Grass has been popping off about SOFM all tournament <laughs> long, but as the LPL representative, I wanted to give you the same opportunity to pop off about this guy because he's he's been impressing me personally. The thing I love about this guy is just how unique he thinks about the jungle role. He has a lot of like really strange pathings where he ends up in the enemy jungle when you don't think he should be able to. His builds are insane. I swear this man builds Warmogs every single game. Maybe not the most efficient, but hey, it's getting Sooning wins. And I feel like his efficiency and creativity are one of the strongest points for Sooning, you know, not only in this group, but in the World Championship. Going to need continued creativity out of them if they want to challenge, I think, especially in the knockout stages. But things are looking good so far now at 1-1 one and one after a close loss to G uh, G2 earlier in the group stages. Let's now flip the script over to JDG versus Rogue. They got the win here today, so now in second place in that group, B, 2-1. and one. How are you feeling about the way that JD showed up today? So the thing I loved was uh, their, their very early game, how they like chain small sequences together, starting from Yagao's TP where he helped like force Bryo to guarantee Kanavi Scuttle, transitioning that into the top gank, which allowed them then to get the, the wave bounce back. And they coordinated it so well with Lumao's Rome topside to set up for that big Herald play. I'm so glad we got to see uh, Lumao Bard as well. A couple of these plays setting up for the rest of the team, some of the picks they got, the way that they use their range. Uh, I, I, this was a JDG that I wanted to see. And, and after their, their first loss, you know, people started to, to lose a little bit of confidence uh, going up against another one of the tournament favorites. This thing, I, I feel like this game's got to give a lot of it back. And one of the things that was really highlighted to me in this one was the speed of, of their macro and the decisions that they forced on their opponents. I really, really loved how they were willing to sacrifice very small objectives, like a couple turret plates on top side, to make a big bottom side play. Um, I just wanted to pull an extra re replay from when they pick up this Rift Herald, they put it in the hands of Zoom. And Zoom says, all right, we're teleporting bottom with the Caitlyn that's been pushing on this turret for multiple fights where they let Caitlyn push down uh, the first plates by herself. And then, yes, you are going to leave topside open for a couple of turret plates pushed there, but you get first tower, you get second tower, and you get the dragon all at the same time. And JDG, they just force uh, the other teams to try and catch up to their game plan rather than, you know, going 50-50 or, or making even trades or anything like that. Uh, Demonte, yeah, help me. Yeah, just help me Sorry. understand why this works. What, what, what's going on here? Well, I think I think what you see JDG do a lot, it's it's something that I felt that Fun Plus Phoenix did a lot last year, where they just don't ever react to the enemy team. They will always make their own play, and they'll always force enemies to react to them. And that's what we just watched in that play there. The Renekton knows that he can't farm the top wave anymore. He knows that he can't farm the jungle camps on the top side. So he just TP's bot. He's like, hey man, you're gonna share this tower gold with me. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna just be weak this entire game. And then they you know, they're just strong. They just get two towers, like you said. Uh, Lyric, what's your assessment of that? I mean, is this is this a given when it comes to the LPL teams, or where does this come from? This idea that you know it's less about responding to the opponent and more about finding the better answer in any given in any given moment. It's a bit weird because I feel like LPL teams for some reason over the years have developed into more of, I'll kind of call them like specialist teams, like teams will all in on like their strong points and they don't care about meta. They don't care what anyone else is doing. They're just going to play for that. And again, however it's developed over the, the years, it's just what LPL has been so good at, but kind of honing in on JDG. It's also so interesting to me that when they make these plays, it seems like everyone's watching like the wave states of the other laners because they just always sync these plays at the most perfect time. 
I I'm, I love that call out. I mean, the idea that they're working in, in perfect synergy at any moment, and that's I guess really what it feels like. Is so often I think we're caught off guard. I, I say we, the royal we. I'm caught off guard by the decision uh, that the team is making and how ingenious it is in the moment. So the foresight that they must have to be able to link up and make those kind of macro plays that you called out there, Kobe, is just massive. Uh, Lyric, just final thoughts on on the LPL's performance so far through three days. How are you feeling confident? Is this going to chalk? Were you expecting more or less at this point? Man, it has been great. I mean, especially after today, right? We, we, we just went 3-0 today, like the LPL as a whole. So it's looking good. LGD obviously won the other day as well. I'm really excited to see their matchup against TSM, which obviously is a throwback to 2015. So I think LPL's like feeling great, especially after planes where people were down on LGD, but now they're looking better. Like things are only going up from here. Sweet, sweet. Well, that TSM LGD matchup is the sixth game of the day tomorrow, so make sure you tune in for that one. Lyric, again, thank you so much for joining us. As always, we'll catch up with you on future days. Yep, thanks, guys. All right, we're going to step away. On the other side, there's more World's Cool Down coming at you. Welcome back to World's Cool Down, presented by State Farm. Crumbs is back in, and Crumbs, I'm coming straight to you on Dom One Gaming versus PSG. Dom One, 3 and 0. This is the team that has impressed me the most so far with the dominance in which they've been winning. Rightfully so. In the race for the Summoners Cup, Dom One Gaming is gaining a lot of ground on a lot of teams, and. The big thing for this team for me right now has been Naguri, the top laner. I mean, this guy's already had two games that are entirely deathless. Here, he gets hard camped. If you remember PSG from the play-ins, you see that this team can be very explosive. Different players now, but they're still pushing their advantage wherever they can. They have something in the top lane, but what ends up happening is that Damwon Gaming just has better players. This is just what it looks like. They are out CSing PSG in every category. And here, this is the second dive against the Kennen, but the first time they tried this three-man dive, he traded one kill. And after that, he's now able to solo kill his opponent in between turrets. You just dope this guy three-on-one twice, and this is still what he's able to do. It's incredibly impressive because that freed up the rest of the map. And then watch him wait for his flank very carefully with the cannon. Nobody else has played cannon thus far. This team has played 14 unique champions in a maximum of possibly 15. They're basically just picking whatever they want every single time and no one seems to have an answer. Uh, Demonte, how do you even approach assessing a squad like this? I didn't even know that 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 stat that Crumbs just cited 14 unique champions out of a 15 possible across three games. You're looking at a player like Nuggery, who we talked about earlier, has all of these different options from carry to supportive utility type champions, and he seems to have the same level of performance on all of them. Yeah, that is a ridiculous stat. I didn't know that either. And I think this is just another reason to be scared of these top teams. I think Demon is showing it, and I think Top Esports are showing it. Or not Demon, sorry. Top Esports and, uh, yeah, Top Esports and Demon are indeed showing it. <laughs> yes. Sorry. They, they're just showing that they have these massive champion pools, and that's something that you normally don't expect out of the top teams. You expect them to play you know, their, their exact style, and then you expect the bottom teams to be playing this, this crazy stuff, but it seems like it's backwards this time around. Kobe, uh, he got hard camped, and the man came away with four solo kills. What is going on? The, 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 <laughs> the quickness with which they make their decisions. So you see, from the beginning of that replay, we saw bottom side, as soon as Dom won, saw support roam. Bottom immediately went for the 2v1 kill. They get the kill there while they're getting camped on top side. Then Nugri as well, even after getting camped so hard and losing uh, out on some of the CS, still able to, between the turrets, find solo kills for himself. And then the patience that he showed later for that dragon fight, I think that's the key because people don't realize how hard it is to play Kennen into champions like Lulu and uh, the ultimate from Kindred. Those, those things can nullify your ultimate uh, in a single move by themselves if you're not patient and you don't find the right moment. Yeah, so far, so far, the player of the tournament for me has got to be uh, Nuggery again to go from a Lulu performance just yesterday where he comes out on the winning side of it to then flip over to the Kennen against the Lulu this time around and still to come out on top. Uh, I mean, Crumbs, I just I can't get over it. I can't get over it. It's because you think that playing top lane carries means you have to play Camille, Jax, Fiora. It's like, no. You can actually pop off with a Lulu. You can play the map. You can take advantages early and win the game that way. So he's already 
switching the script on top lane. And just for a little bit of history, this is the guy that was playing Klepto Vlad, that was playing Cole Mages in the top lane. Like, this is what he had initially brought into the League of Legends scene, and now we're starting to see as he developed further as a player, hey, turns out he's still really damn good. Yeah, this, this guy is evolving into the whole package. He can play fast, but he can also play solo. He can play calculated, but he can also play aggressive as possible. It's just insane. Yeah, one of the most exciting teams to watch here at the world stage so far. Also one of the best. 3-0 and undefeated so far in the group stages. We got one more matchup to talk about. That's FlyQuest versus Unicorns of Love, where DeMonte, North America, picked up our very first win of the 2020 group stages. <laughs> Power of Evil is putting NA on its back, baby. Let's go. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about solo. I think we just all <laughs> choose to ignore that. Nothing happened up there. But uh, Power of Evil, man, the performance he put on this game today was insane. I feel like the mid gap was just crazy. You see you see here he solo kills no mans and throughout the whole game he's playing really consistently, really, really strong, doing a ton of damage and yeah, he picks up NA its first win. Now you play against PoE. Is this regular season PoE playoffs? Like is it just another tier of his performance that we haven't seen yet? This is this is buffed out jacked PoE. I, this this is insane. <laughs> yeah, he's kill. playing out of his mind. Look at that kill he gets on the jungler as the infernal dragon is going down so close to giving over soul. He just saves so many of these critical moments, and this is where the tension is highest, where the pressure is highest. It was a really, really close game here for Unicorns with a big lead, constantly on soul point, uh, constantly farming kills off of the top side of the map, killing solo, diving him, creating this, uh, this amount of pressure on FlyQuest. And so that made the standout performance from Power of Evil that much more necessary and that much more <laughs> impressive when he's able to pull this off. I will say that, you know, Ignar and Wild Turtle as well, you know, perform super well. In, uh, you know, in that one, but but the antics that Power of Evil was able to pull off in, in so many of these critical moments really have to give him a perfect uh, word. Necessary. <laughs> Yeah, it was an exciting win, albeit definitely not an easy victory for FlyQuest. And, and again, I think that's where we got to go tip our caps to Unicorns of Love while they are 0-2. I think this is a team that can make that Group D quite interesting. They have the opportunity to take a game off of a team like FlyQuest and maybe even DRX. I don't know about Top Esports so much, the expected 6-0 out of that group. Uh, but a win on the board for North America is huge. And I think the fact that it comes from, uh, from FlyQuest, the team, you know, number one seed from the region, yes, but also one of the teams that we have talked about does have that never give up kind of attitude, even in games where they're down, even in games where Solo is taking his lickings in the top lane. This, I think, of all of the North American squads is the team most willing to still get back in there off of an Ignar engage or something of the like and actually start a fight. It's, uh, and, and they're planting trees and, and doing things for the environment, too. So at the very least, they're like, hey... We're getting something out of this. <laughs> I love it. Hey, look. First win. Come on. <laughs> we got yeah, we got a win. And we planted some trees. Damn right. All right. Well, today's State Farm Assist of the Day goes to FlyQuest Power of Evil for lifting the morale of an entire region with his Syndra play. Kobe, coming back to you because it was all around that dragon. Oh, my goodness. There are so many high-intensity moments here. Look at this. They lose out Wild Turtle really early on, so you already know that the huge burden to output damage is going to be on Power of Evil. He finds that stun just over the wall, barely taking out Gadget. Then when Solo goes down, it's actually only going to be the DPS from Power of Evil, and he's still able to get another Syndra ultimate off onto Ananasek, takes down the jungler. So once again, when these dragon fights these smites for the critical soul come up he focuses down the jungler he gets the right target um he had amazing stats throughout the game he was unfazed by what was going on around him yeah it's just another game where you see a player putting up four digit almost, almost four digit dpm numbers it's it's crazy yeah, absolutely wild. Massive carry performance out of him. Uh, again, you love to see it, and hopefully that can be maybe the beginnings of some confidence for the North American squads moving forwards. Again, that's my bias and my hope showing through. And they needed uh, that one. <laughs> but we needed it. Exactly right. Exactly right. And we got it. Now, before we call it a day, I think we should jump into our honors for the day, where we give a feels-good award to those that deserve it. So, Crumbs, coming to you first, and then we'll go down the line. <laughs> 
All right. Well, you already hinted at who one of the most exciting players is, but I'm going to echo that sentiment. Noguri in the top laner from Damwon Gaming. This guy is just on another level right now. Compared to other top laners, his champion pool is insane. He's actually performing on all of these champions, and we know he has even more. Like He's getting a ton of bans aimed at him. We have yet to see his Vladimir. We have yet to see what he can do on picks like Jack. So I think that this guy is a must-watch. You just have to see every single time that Damwon one place, something is going to happen around Naguri. Yeah, again, I'll reiterate, he's the guy who introduced the Lulu and then introduced how to beat the Lulu on the very next day. Uh, Demonte, what about you? Where are you throwing your honors? My honors are all going to Pyruel, baby. He put <laughs> NA on his back. I think he played out of his mind from minute one. He just was trading so well on no man's, and <laughs> until the end of the game, he was just carrying well. All right, yeah. Kobe, I, I know you've I mean, got a I unique was, I pick. I was also so. going to go Power of Evil here. I, I mean, most North American viewers, I think, are, I have to give all these honors to Power of Evil. But you know what? You can't give multiple honors. Um, honestly, a lot of games, I find myself giving tilt proof to people for, for honors. Mm. That is also an honor, although a little bit dubious one. And we could give that one to Solo, you know. He, he got killed over and over and over in the top side of the map, but he still had an impact later in some of those fights and, and most of it is about trying to create space for power of evil uh to do the do the carrying but you know tilt proof is, is also something you can give out for honors he had a really good flank he was one yeah. and six and still is thinking about finding a flank to win the team fight instead of grouping with the team being really weak so i think that is the the embodiment of being tilt proof like yeah i might be feeding but i can still be useful how i am supposed to play my champion that was a soul-saving flank, yeah, to say the least. He still had plenty of impact on the game. Now, today's Was Asleep Didn't Watch is going to DeMonte. So DeMonte is going to give us his one-minute summary of what he loved from Groups Day 3. DeMonte, the time is yours. The one thing that I loved today more than anything else was the top end play. I think... In particular, I just loved watching how many carries there are in the top lane meta right now. I think the teams that are picking tanks and the teams that are not really giving resources to their top laners are kind of faltering at the moment. And on top of that, I just really love watching top lane carries. I think in the last game of the day, we got to see the Renekton Quinn matchup. And in the last three games of the day, we got to see the Renekton. And, you know, it's a, it's a pick that is very... Uh, I would say conflicted in the league community, but it's a pick <laughs> that is definitely strong, and it's a pick that we're going to keep seeing, and I don't plan it to stop. I don't plan for it to stop at all. I want to ask you a question since you're on the top, uh, top winner point. Do you think that the eventual winner of Worlds will have to have a carry top winner, or can it be done, let's say, a player like Finn who's been, who's been sticking more to tanks? Um, I think... Most definitely, it's going to be a carry top laner that's going to hoist the Summoner's Cup this year. And that's not to say you can't play Lulu and carry. So you might see some supports up there as well. But I just don't think tanks are that strong. That's a good distinction. You can still carry even on a non-carry champion. Well, there you have it, my friends. The one-minute wrap-up for the day. Let's take a look at what's in store for us tomorrow with our schedule. Day four of group stages. A couple of our groups are going to be finishing their first round robin, but group A will kick off the day. You got G2 Esports up against Team Liquid, followed by Sun Ning and Amachi. So that's going to be a near last chance for North America to start getting some wins on the board there in group A. Then over to group D, DRX versus FlyQuest Top versus Unicorns of Love, finishing it out with Group C, Fnatic versus Gen G, and TSM versus LGD. I will remind everyone that Lyric called out that sixth game of the day, TSM versus LG, LGD as his one to watch. But Demonte, out of this slate of six games, which one excites you the most? Hmm. I, I, I'm, I, I gotta go for the game one. G2 versus Team Liquid. I wanna see is. NA absolutely stomp Ooh. you. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know which one stands out for me though, because there is to me NA is synonymous with one name right now, Power of Evil. I want to see how Power Ooh. of Evil stacks up against Chovy out of DRX. All right, that's game three. So a lot of focus, obviously, on the North American teams for us. Kobe, anything else jumping out to you on that schedule? I was gonna say Fnatic versus Gen G because I yeah. think that group to me, that group is is incredibly volatile. Uh, and I'm excited to see, you know, who goes down to tiebreakers. I feel like I feel like either of those teams could definitely take that victory. I think that's going to be a really close and exciting matchup. Yeah, candidly, Group A and Group C are the ones that are feeling like they really still have a lot of figuring out to do and anyone could make it out. Whereas, you know, BD feeling a little bit more decided just based on the dominance of the top team in each of those groups. Uh, I like how you still have hope in Group A.
I, well, I didn't say, hey, I, tr I did not say I had hope for TL. I just don't think that it's decided that, that, that maybe Machi sneaks into top three is all I'm saying uh, over there. Anyway, that's going to do it for us here on World's Cool Down. DeMonte, I want to thank you so much for lending us your time and joining us today. But on behalf of myself, the casters, and all of the remote broadcast crews from all around the world, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you tomorrow for more Worlds.